morning. Good morning. Welcome to Madison Square, and I'd like to extend a special welcome, welcome to our visitors here. Uh, our friend Randy Bear is somewhere here in Berlin, visiting from Arkansas. Welcome, Randy. I have just a few announcements this morning I wanted to go through. Um, we have still have our small group sheets in the back on the candle stand, so if you're still interested in joining one of the small groups, uh, those, those sheets are still in the black. Please go, go check those out. We also still have some star words. When you look at the uh, table in the back, those little blue cards, they're turned face down. That's, supposed, that's because you're not supposed to pick the word you want. <laughs> you're supposed to randomly choose a card, turn it over, and then see what your word is. And that is your, your word for the year. Uh, mine turned out to be leadership. <laughs> Following the lead of some of the folks that spoke to us, uh, This is the table of sustenance.
Let us stand if you're able. Sisters and brothers, rejoice. We live sustained by God's presence and love. As we mourn the wounds of God's children, as we give thanks for brothers and sisters, we have lived the faith. As we struggle for justice, as we work to build the beloved community, as we offer our gifts to all, sisters and brothers, Rejoice.
Let us join together in the prayer of confession. Most holy and merciful God, we acknowledge and confess our slowness to do good, our blindness to injustice, and our complicity to defer the dreams and hopes of the oppressed. We have refused to heed your call to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God. Help us to name our sin, to claim responsibility for our actions, and to change our behavior in accordance with the commands of Jesus Christ. Shake us from our sleep, give us courage, and move us to action, that the justice of your will may be done on earth as in heaven. Through reflection, analysis, and prayer, we are freed to acknowledge the wrongs around us, the pain among us, the sin within us, and the work before us. God's mission of peace and justice is being revealed in our midst. Always remember and never forget, your burden has been lifted. The liberating love of God is at work within you. Let us join together one to another and pass the grace and the peace of our Lord. The and also with you.
I like your hair. It's cute. It's cute. What's the plan here? Jay. Jay. Jay, hold it closer to your mouth. Oh, here? Yeah. I brought a book from a series called Ordinary People Change the World. It's called I Am Brave. I am Martin Luther King Jr. Come join me. The earnest conversation to this little boy. A dream is an adventure that you build inside your mind. So here's Martin down here and he says, can you count all of my books? My dreams grew big with books. Even as a kid, I knew words I'd call it. Start with hope, add some faith, and you'll be amazed at what you'll find. <coughs> you have hope to someone you love. That's what, it's, that's what Martin is saying. My family taught me it's better to have more love in your life that you must never feel that you are less than anyone else. My dreams are a love of making peace and shining light. Lift those who are around you. Be brave and do what's right. So this is part of his speech, he said, until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's part of Back then, not everyone was allowed to sit at the front of the bus to protest those rules. One of my first big speeches demanded that people be treated fairly. One day you will help others. One day you will take a stand. Hold hands. We're all sisters and brothers. It's how we'll reach the promised land. At the March on Washington, Thousands of people came together to demand that everyone be treated equally. Be brave, my little dreamer. We need you more than ever. The very best dream of all is the one we dream together. I am Martin Luther King Jr. and I know nothing but stop our dreams. So can we pray together? Dear God, Dear God, help us to listen. Help, help us to listen. Help us to understand. Help, help us, us to understand. Help us to remember. Help, help us, us to remember. remember. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Interlude by Mark Marty. <laughs> Thank you. 
and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take the light of the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, the mouth of the Lord. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. When you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. My name, for those who don't know me and for those who do, my name is Linda Lee Brown Nance and I'm a member here at Madison Square and I've been here for uh, a few years. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself before I get into doing this. I grew up in, in Fort Worth, Texas on the west side and the west side is an area that um, is, has two aspects of it. There is the upper middle class um, and the, those with a whole lot of money and that's called Ridgely. And then there were the people like me who lived on the other side, and that was called Como. And Como was developed so that the people who lived on that other side could have access to people like my parents, the, the janitors and the 
maids and those kinds of people. And believe it or not, we had a real wall that separated the haves and the have-nots, a real wall that I grew up seeing all my life. It is no longer there, and, it's, and um, if you hadn't grown up there, you wouldn't have known that the wall ever existed. But uh, growing up in Fort Worth, I had very little um, uh, overt racism, let me say that. I knew it existed, but it was never thrown in my face as it was in, in some other places. I can remember one time when I was a teenager, I wanted to be, um, I think they called them candy strikers those days, you know, you could be a volunteer. And the lady said I couldn't because I was black, so, you know. I said, well, okay, maybe, maybe one day. And I went, went to college, I went to college in Austin, Texas, it's a uh, university, it's not a university called Houston Tillerson. And back in the day, we used to wear hats to church, especially black women. So I hadn't bought my hat, so mama told me to go buy your hat. So I went to buy my hat, and I wanted to try it on. The lady said, the only way you can try that hat on is you buy it. So those were the kinds of things that I did see. It wasn't that bad. I did see signs that said white only and for color. And I knew that, where I, that my place was at the back of the bus. But I also know that I stand on the backs and shoulders of a lot of people, not just black people, but white people as well. I ask that you pray for me to get through this, and I ask that you pray that this, that this touches you in some way. <clears throat> I Have a Dream by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I'm happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, not, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the claims of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of mater material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the back of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that would give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hollow spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negroes' legitimate discontent will not pass until there's an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam 
and will now be content, will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will, neither rest, there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we, not, we do not need to be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. As we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs that state for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believe he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied. We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters of righteousness, like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Mississippi, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties in today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream that is deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of this creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created even, equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and some sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that even one day the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day in Alabama with his vicious racist, with his governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls, their sisters and brothers, I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley will be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, 
we'll be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, and to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be a day when all God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of pilgrims' pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be great, a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the height and Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of California. Let freedom ring from the slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, we will allow freedom to ring. We will let it ring from every village, from every hamlet, from every state, every city. We'll be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last.
research and information. for his passion and peace, for his dream of beloved community, and for his tireless quest of a nation that keeps faith with its promises. I have stood in a meeting with hundreds of youngsters and joined in while they sang, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around. 
It is not a song. It is a resolve. These songs bind us together, give us courage together, help us march together. We refuse to believe that we are unable to influence the events which surround us. We refuse to believe that we are so bound to racism and war that the peace is not possible. It is not enough to say we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for it. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of God in heaven. For God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Let us therefore not think of our movement as one that seeks to integrate into all the existing values of American society. Let us be those creative dissenters who will call our beloved country to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion, to a more noble expression of humanness. We believe there is an urgent need for people to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. We must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. The foundation of this way is love. Love is the only force capable of transforming enemies into friends. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. And then they were in the field. Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then God said to Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. The person who passively accept, accepts evil is as much involved in it as the one who helps perpetrate it. The person who accepts evil without protesting it is really cooperating with it. We believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. We believe that what self-centered people have torn down, other-centered people can build up. By the goodness of God at work within the people, we believe that brokenness can be healed. And the lion and the lamb will lie down together, and everyone will sit under their own mind and fig tree, and none shall be afraid. Let us join in prayer, saying the words that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I want to thank you for this opportunity to be here with you today and tell you that if you haven't seen the church from this point of view with this beautiful stained glass in the back that is in the balcony, you need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was God's seed of reconciliation? We will plan reconciliation in all the broken places of people. Now goes Christ's hands of forgiveness. We will embrace everyone who needs the mercy and hope. Now go as the Spirit's eyes of love. We will see each person as our sister and brother.
Mr. Martin. Uh, 